Thank you, Comrade Mizengi, and uh, welcome to members of the press that have come for this uh, press conference. We are, uh, as Comrade Mizengi has uh, rightly introduced us, my name is Rashid Mahia, I'm the chairperson of the Crisis Zimbabwe Coalition, a coalition of about 90 civil society organizations that are working towards uh, free society, democratic society, and for protecting and promoting the rights of the citizens. And we come today at a very optional moment where we are commemorating 11 March 2007, which was, a, it was an event that was organized by a broad alliance of uh, progressive uh, organizations from civil society organizations the, to labor, the young people, uh, political parties, progressive political parties in 2007. And the idea of that campaign it was called, it was a sales battle campaign, and the theme, the theme was no to elections before a democratic constitution. And that was the theme of that campaign uh, as it was running. And you recall that there was no, we were campaigning for a constitution and we wanted reforms before the elections that took place. But also it was coming against a background of a lot of uh, issues that were taking place, an increase, uh, increase in inflation, the cost of living was high, the, the life, the life, uh, the standard of life of the citizens was at an all-time low, and the democratic space was shrinking. Uh, civil liberties were being taken away from the citizens, and then citizens realized that there was need to come together collectively, as uh, citizens and in, in, in different forms to uh, register their concerns and campaign and engage and confront uh, the situation as it were. So it is, explains why we are here today, because I think the conditions have not changed. The situation still remains the same, and uh, we, have, we have need and reason and cause to be here and to commemorate. <laughs> so we are not just commemorating, we are commemorating, reflecting, and saying, looking in the rearview mirror, and saying, what do we do going forward as the progressive movement, so that we are able to deal with the current kind of crisis that we face uh, progressively together. So this explains why we are here. We are expecting other players to come and be part of this. So I, that's part of the introduction. And you know what happened on the 11th of March? Uh, people were brutalized when they when organized the prayer march uh, in, in, in Highfields, Zimbabwe grounds. The, pro the program was being coordinated by the Christian Alliance, and Dr. Bishop Magai is here representing the Christian Alliance. So wh what you see here in front of you are organizations and representatives of organizations and institutions that participated in the process. So it's not, it's not exhaustive as, as we talk about going forward. We obviously need a broader, bigger alliance of all progressives to work uh, and put pressure on the state for us to enjoy our liberties, but at the same time to open the democratic space, but to improve the conditions of living of the citizens. So this explains why we are here in commemorating, looking back in the past for us to look ahead and, put, and, 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 and plan ahead. So with me here are uh, people that, uh, leaders that represent the institutions that were part of the, of, of the campaign. 
to my uh, far right is uh, the student leadership in uh, Nancy in Jenge, uh, leadership of Zinasu. Uh, and then we have got uh, uh, Comrade Peter Tasa, the president of, uh, of the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions. And then uh, Bishop Magaya, representing the Christian Alliance. And uh, Advocate uh, Nelson Chamisa, the president of the MDC Alliance. And uh, of course, uh, Comrade Mzengi, whom you are quite aware of, uh, whom you are quite familiar with. So without wasting a lot of our time, and your time, since we made you wait, I uh, would ask um, uh, the church perspectives. So we're going to give each other about five minutes. <coughs> after everyone has given, has given their po position, and then we'll give uh, the members of the place an opportunity to ask questions uh, as we proceed. So I'll ask uh, each of our of the speakers to dedicate about five minutes at most uh, on, 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 as they give their perspective on that day and going forward. So I'll start with uh, Bishop Magaya, the church perspective <coughs> on the Zimbabwe campaign, position positing the alternative. Bishop Magaya. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rashid Mahia and uh, members of the press. I want to welcome you. May the Lord richly bless you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let, me, let me make reference to the scriptures because this is where our perspectives is terms from. Isaiah chapter number 62, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, For Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace until her salvation rises and her righteousness blazes like a torch. So a careful reading of that portion there surface two things. Isaiah here brings to the fore two critical issues that I think should guide our reflections as we commemorate the 2000, 2007 11th of March brutal show of force by the state. First, the realization of the salvation and a season of enlightenment of Jerusalem. So this is one thing that the prophet uh, states here that he would want to see the salvation of uh, Jerusalem and the ensuing enlightenment and, 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 and if you were speaking in the context of Zimbabwe it was going to be the salvation of this country and enlightenment of the same. Second, to this end the prophet and all the like-minded are resolute never ever to relent but to continue advocating for the realization of the salvation of Jerusalem. He says, I will not remain quiet. I will not hold my peace. We are gathered here to commemorate the events of 14 years ago when the state, through its agents, descended on the masses and violently disrupted the prayer meeting resulting in a number of people being injured in the process with one gift tandira uh, brutally shot dead. And it should be clearly noted that um, he died uh, at the hands of the state. It should be noted that uh, Zimbabwe has journeyed through torrid cycles of socio-economic and political dark chapters ever since our independence honeymoon and the event of the 11th of March 2007 is part of these repeated cycles. It is tragic to speak it, yet true to say that uh, the cycle in which we are currently is characterized by continued arbitrary arrests. We know very well that some of our young persons are wallowing in prison right now, the likes of uh, Marco, etc., uh, Takuz and Gazuore. They're wallowing in prison, torture, Selective application of the law, where, for instance, the likes of uh, Chimono wallows in prison uh, for weeks, whilst Obadiah Moyo gets his bail within 24 hours. This is obnoxious. There is abuse of lockdown regulations, among many other ills. Now, if 14 years ago we coalesced around issues that bedeviled our country, and we still have the same issues, if not more. We have to come around once again to build the Zimbabwe that we want. 
Now, as I close, I want to just bring your attention again to Isaiah chapter number 1, verses 21 to 23, where the prophet again says, How the faithful city has become an adulterous harlot, she who was full of justice, uprightness, and right standing with God once lodged in her. This is now history, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, ngura. You know, def de def deflation, de devaluation of the currents. Your wine is mixed with water, which means no more values. Your princes are rebels and champions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and runs after compensation and reward. They judge not for the fatherless, nor defend them. Neither does the cause of the widow come to them, for they delay or turn a deaf ear. Now the prophet, he attributes the devaluation of Jerusalem's currents to four vices. And I want you to take note that sanctions is not one of them. He states corruption. He states violence or murder. He states injustice. And number four, idolatry. I am fully persuaded that these four today are the reasons for why we are where we are as Zimbabweans today. And I want to, uh, uh, to, to submit that unless we stage up, we stage a, a persistent res a resistance, uh, and even perhaps more, this country will continue in cycles of violence. And perhaps as we reflect, we need to ask ourselves this question, what is it about them that made us what we did? and what we are no longer doing. Why, what, what, what is the difference and what is the gap? I want to challenge us today to be able to answer to this question. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think. Thank you, Bishop Mabai. What is it about them? That's the question. We need to answer. Comrade Vitam uh, what is it about them? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you uh, all for coming. I want to start by uh, pointing out uh, wisdom from Marcus Calvin that uh, people without knowledge of their past history, culture, uh, and, and, and origin is like a tree without fruits. So as we commemorate uh, 11 March, we need to always uh, remember that we need to educate ourselves, we need to educate uh, future generations about our past. Zimbabweans have been uh, through a lot of dark past, as uh, Bishop has said. As we commemorate this day, 11 March, we should not forget about Kukura Wundi, mm. uh, atrocities and uh, genocide. We should not forget about uh, in 13 September 2006 brutalization of trade union activists and leaders. We must not forget about um, the displacements uh, in Chiazwa and the colonial displacements now in Chilonga. And this points out to a state that is clearly against its people. Today, as we reflect, we see a state that has become the most dangerous thing against its citizens. Climate change is there, droughts are there, many other natural uh, accidents and um, uh, global pandemics like COVID are there. But the biggest threat to the security of Zimbabweans today is the state as led by the current government. So it is said that uh, we lost people on 1 August 2018 defenseless people in the streets of Harare. It is said that we lost people in January 13 to 16, January 2019, defenseless citizens against an heavily armed state. And we need to reflect all these issues today and chart the way forward. So to me, the words of uh, the late hero, national hero, Dr. Joshua Komo, rings uh, truth in my ears that uh, the hardest lesson of his time is came late and it was that a nation can win freedom without its people becoming free. We are talking about this uh, situation today when in our view the Zimbabwe state is now a failed state. 
it is a failed state that has also lost legitimacy. We can argue academically and use all the intellectual ways that we have, but you will see that Zimbabwean state is a failed state when you fall ill and you go to Parreniatwa, Pilo, Sakum, Mutare, or General Hospital, and you fail to get attention or even a painkiller. You will realize that Zimbabwe is a failed state when you send your kids to schools on 15 and 22nd this month and there are no teachers at school because teachers are incapacitated. So from a working class perspective, nothing is working in this country. Zimbabwe is a failed state that has failed to provide the security of persons. In fact, the government has turned rogue and it is operating like a militia, abducting citizens, brutalizing citizens, uh, some are sexually harassed, unlawful detention and pre-trial detentions. So this points to a state that has failed to discharge each major obligation of providing security to, state, to, to citizens. We also have a failed state in the form of a state that is failing to provide public services. There's nothing that is working in this country. Yesterday I was reading about a sad story of a nurse who has gone on go, uh, uh, on, on go funding me uh, uh, processes to seek money for her to get uh, MRI scan. Someone who is working for the health services cannot afford MRI scan. The working class majority of them are earning $25. That's uh, 25 loaves of bread per month. The domestic workers are earning 9 US dollars. That is 9 loaves of bread for the whole month. To book an ambulance if you are COVID positive or you suspect that you are positive, you need 190 US dollars. So a domestic worker has to work for 30 something months and not spending a cent for them to book an ambulance. To be accommodated or to be accepted at a hospital or a COVID-19 facility, you need a minimum of 800 US dollars. A domestic worker has to work for ages. Mm -hmm. Those who are working for and earning uh, minimum wages the, uh, of 25 US dollars, they will have to work for ages without spending anything to save life. So we have a, a state that is now protecting and safeguarding the interests of the few at the expense of the majority. And this is a, a, a big issue that we are facing today. And what are the reasons of that state uh, uh, failure? Uh, Bishop Magai has already spoken about it. It's corruption. It's uh, autocracy, dictatorship. It is state capture. The state is no longer functioning. It has been captured by the few. It is a whole lot of poor governance and mismanagement of the economy. It is brutality against the citizens. So, Chairman, without wasting uh, much of your time, what do we need to do? We in the labor movement believe that we actually have a generational call to fight against the twin evils. This is a, a big civic duty that we can't run away from. The twin evils that we have are repression and neoliberalism induced misery. Every one of us is in misery. People are waiting for nothing. And the reasons are repression and neoliberalism. So some in the trade union movement believe that unions must be apolitical. We think this is ignorance. And we want to point out that the trade union must play politics in order to free the class, the working class. Yeah, I think Harold Lasso made it easy for us. What is politics? Politics simply who gets what, when, and how. So this is why the trade union movement must be at the forefront. We know that all, all of our benefits, our salaries, our pensions, even reproductive choices, and everything that a human being deserves is determined by politicians. The men and women in cabinet, the men and women in the parliament are determining our lives. And I'm making a call to all workers that this is the time to shrug off the ignorance and focus on freeing ourselves. So, Chairman, there's no any other way, a bottom-up approach. It has to be grassroots based. That was that is what it was in 1999 on the National People, Working People's Convention. And I think now is the time for the second National Working People's Convention. That is what it was in on 11 March on the Save Zimbabwe campaign. And we need to quickly organize ourselves. That's right and come together. There is no way to avoid class collaboration. No. 
we also need to clarify the most important agenda. What is it that we are fighting for? I know my brothers and sisters in politics, they want political power and they are looking for political uh, freedom. We need political freedom, but we are also fighting for total freedom, right. including social and economic progressive change right. for the working class, working men and women in this country. So we need to clarify that agenda. We need to mobilize for that agenda. 11 October was a mass mobilization exercise, and we can't run away from it. We need to mobilize seriously, but above all, we need to take action. It is only power of the collective citizens that can withstand the power of the Amaris in the, in the, in the, in the uh, possessed by the armies of the world. So we need to take action. We need all our activities to be based on a clear ideological position. And for us, is the fight against neoliberalism, is the fight against fascism, is the fight against uh, dictatorship. It is the fight for total freedom. And uh, Comrade uh, Chair, thank you very much, but allow me to end with a quotation from John Lewis. Our struggle is not a struggle of one day, one week, or one year. Ours is not a struggle of one judicial appointment or presidential term. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime, or maybe even many lifetimes. And each one of us, in every generation, must do our part. And that is what we are supposed to do. It may be tough. Some may be disillusioned, some may, be, uh, may lose lives, some, of, uh, some may also be co-opted, some may be through co cohesion join them, some may uh, lose hope, but it has to be done. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Governor President. Uh, I think there's clarity today. Yes, yeah. very, very clear on the need for class collaborations, yeah. political freedoms, total freedom, mm. and the power of the collective. And we need to build from the bottom up, from the grassroots going up. It's very clear. And you spoke about the generation. Every generation has got a responsibility. And I, I come to the comrades from Zinasu. Comrade Nancy, the generation, what does the generation say about the current situation? Uh, thank you so much, Comrade Chair. Uh, allow me to honor my president in absentia, Taku Zagazore, who is currently uh, in police custody. My major concern uh, in the pursuit of a democratic uh, agenda in Zimbabwe is the continuously shrinking civic and democratic, democratic space and how we are letting each other down as activists, as uh, political leaders and as civic leaders. How we are letting our own people um, perish in cells, go, go detained, and we are silent about it. How each of us is pursuing a selfish agenda, how each of us is fighting for relevance, we are busy fighting um, fighting internally in our different institutions while just ignoring the major cause, while just ignoring the major problem in Zimbabwe right now. Right now we have Lokumbari Rarisuisha, we have Takuza Gazwari, and two young, young women from the MDC, Cecilia and Joanna, who are currently in custody for speaking out, for challenging the systems, and for defending human rights. Uh, we, as the leaders, back then, uh, the South Zimbabwe, campaign. We, have, we were united. The problem right now is quite complicated. We are fighting a state that is armed. We are fighting a government that is scared of its own citizens, but uses all machinery to fight us, or uses all machinery to attack us. Therefore, we need a united front. We need a united approach. We need to get together, to go back to the drawing board, to the, to the drawing board, re-strategize and fight back as a united force, and fight back with one voice. So I think that's my major concern. And the other thing is how we as students are fighting our own battles with our support maybe from other like-minded organizations. Thank you ZCTU for the continuous self, uh, solidarity and support. But then I think we need to consolidate our, and amplify our voices right now, from now going forward. Uh, if we pay, uh, if, we, if we first fee sites, I expect um, political players to speak out. I expect teachers unions to speak out. I expect trade unionists to speak out and support us. And the same applies if um, workers are having lower wages. They are our parents, we support them. So what we need right now is to consolidate our voices and speak in one voice. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Very clear, the United Front building back together. Solidarity 
is one of the key principles of the, of the progressive movement. An injury to one is an injury to all of us, and it affects all of us. But thank you, Robert. And we're trying to be conscious of time, since we waited for a long time. Uh, other other companies that were supposed to come are still on their way, and we will proceed. And we think uh, we'll, we'll have another event when they have to come. After all, this has been safe from the civil society and uh, comrades that are here. We leave this uh, chance to to the president of the movement for democratic change, Comrade uh, Chamisa. What is the political society? What is the political society's role in consolidating and broader alliances? About your understanding of this, and what is the way forward? Comrade President. Well, thank you very much, um, um, Comrade Mahia, and to celebrate and honor our Reverend. Am I allowed to remove my mask? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Mahia, and allow me to honor uh, Dr. Makaya here present, Reverend, and also my comrade, Comrade uh, President Tassa, um, for uh, being here, my sister from Zenasu, uh, Comrade Mzenge from the media uh, uh, platform, and all of you. Uh, first, I want to start by uh, just apologizing for a late start. Um, this was due to the organizers and the challenges that we had. Uh, around coordination, but uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I don't need to say much. Um, you know that I'm not the one who is supposed to have been here. Um, President Shangra is the one who was supposed to be here because he was the uh, father figure and also the leader of our movement. Uh, but because he's not here, I was also part of that movement. I'm representing him. I'm also representing those ideals that we stood for during that time. Uh, this is a very important platform. You are aware that from a political perspective, we have already, as a party, resolved that we are going to encourage the dissolution and dissolving of individual institutional voices or individual voices and make sure that we magnify and amplify the collective voice of all Zimbabwe. It's no longer time for us to be divided in our little silos. It's now time for us to be united. This is no longer time for partisan politics. This is now time for collective action. And this platform is a citizen action. We are not going to be coming to this platform as politicians. We are coming to this platform as citizens. We are also inviting even Zanupia, because hunger knows no party. This has nothing to do with partisan politics. It has something to do with our collective being and our dignity as a people. So I would encourage ZANU-PF to also join the convergence of forces. Because if they are a force, they must also be part of this. If they are citizens, they must all be part of this. Because what we are having in this country is a clash between those who have power and those who have none. And citizens have no power. They need to come together and realize their power. So this platform for us is very important. It's a convergence platform, and we're willing to converge. We'll bring our own abilities, our capacities, to support uh, this so that we're able to move forward. Any nation is ultimately determined by what it seeks to achieve. And what we seek to achieve is liberation, democratization, transformation, so that we're able to realize our full potential as a people. So I don't want to say much. I'm here to add the voice, and when I'm here, I'm carrying more than two million voices, not just of voters, but of Zimbabweans who believe and who are clear that what we stand for should be defended in the collective. We amplify and support the voice from ZCTU, the voice from the church, the voice from the students, and I believe that next time you are going to invite more veterans, because they are very important to be part of this. Don't leave them out. We need more veterans to be part of this. We need uh, women, even women organizations, to be part of this. We need everyone to be part of this. Those who are willing to participate in defending our country. I want to thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Comrade President. Uh, now uh, we open we open the the platform to the members of the press to ask questions. Uh, 
So, yes, the, the floor is open. Those around ask questions? So, is this just one question? Is there another one? Yes, you can ask. Your name and My name is Keith Sanigatin. So, I want to direct your question to Mr. Jasper and uh, Mr. Jamisa. That uh, since 2007 up to now, there's been a continuity of Danupia, and Danupia uh, has used the mechanism, different mechanisms above them all, uh, like you were saying, the use of force against the progressive forces. So from now, what do you intend to do different? differently because uh, the NPF back then in 2007 they used the police force but now according to instances you are they are now using guns against innocent civilians so what are you going to do differently to achieve the, what you term trust collaboration so social and economic progressive change how different are you going to how, how are you going to do that different? Thank you. Do you have another question? I just want to check the questions. Do you have another question? Yes. Uh, John Kasim, I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, it's a question, one question is directed partly to the ZCTU and Mr. Chamisa. You made a call with ZCTU uh, saying that uh, this is time to reunite again like you were during the term. Uh, uh, when uh, Tandira was killed. Uh, the unit <coughs> that was there uh, seems not to be possible now because of the fighting, splitting, especially of MDC, uh, toppling each other for power and so forth. Uh, what is it that you think can be done different uh, to, 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 to make people unite and for Mr. Chamisa, people are saying Zimbabwe is in, in a crisis. The fighting that we've seen, Mr. Monzora, Kuku yourself, and so forth, but you remain silent. And people are saying, your statements were heard for too long. We need action. How come the action is, seems to be coming? Maybe it, it's, it's not coming at all against the crime as a city that you need to unite and come with a different strategy. I think that's what the public are asking as well, that we need action, not just statements. Thank you. I think we do have other questions. Ah, OK, so we. After this question, I think I have a answer to the end. That's what you want to follow up. Ah. OK, so we'll just do Thank you, um, comrades. I think we, we agree completely that uh, the struggle is taken long. We also agree that uh, the environment is even worse. We now are under a military junta. A military junta means uh, suspension of all constitutional rights and any civic and political rights. So the situation is now worse than what it was. But we also realize, and uh, this is why I premised my submissions on Marcus Garvey, that we need to learn from our history. I think the situation was the same in 19, in 1960s because the trade unions have been fighting since 1920, 1927. And since 1940s, the trade unions were calling for, for stay aways, for strikes with Benjamin Burombo, with Joshua Komo. Imagine from 1940 to 1960, 20 years, and you appear to be in a wilderness. Imagine from 1940 to 1979, even on the eve of independence, there are some people who were probably losing hope and disillusioned. So that's the nature of this struggle. The civil rights movement in America took ages. Women took over a century to attain political rights. Uh, the black movement took many years. The dream that uh, um, uh, uh, was dreamed by our reverend uh, took centuries <clears throat> for it to be uh, for people to see some some light and they're still fighting for that dream 
So this is what we want to, to all focus ourselves on. The struggle is not going to be easy. We never emphasized there was euphoria, ephemeral consciousness in, the, in 1999. People were thinking that they were moving straight away and gaining political freedom and economic freedom. But I think we have learned a lot. So the struggle is not going to be a symbol. It's going to take time. But what do we need to do? Which also dovetails with uh, the second question uh, that was raised, that we are continuously talking about issues. I think what we need to do is to have continuous civil resistance. Mm. We have not been consistent. We are here today commemorating 11 March 2007. The other time we're commemorating uh, 13 September 2006. The other time we're commemorating uh, Jan 1 August 2018. 29, uh, 13 January 2019. So we can no longer sustain the struggle through once off and yearly pilgrimages of a struggle. We need a continuous struggle and we have got our own local heroes who have shown us. Yesterday we were talking about um, Itai Zamara. One man who checked the regime daily, monthly, yearly, focusing on a particular issue. We are talking about God's word, we are talking about Marco, youngsters who have been consistent and persistent in the struggle. So this is what we think we need to do, all of us. So we need to raise that uh, consciousness. We need to uh, free, for us to be free politically, we first of all need to free ourselves from fear. All of us are afraid, so we need to free ourselves from fear. The second aspect is that uh, the struggle by nature will take long because it has to be non-violent. You cannot face a junta with violence. That is their territory. Mm -hmm. You cannot face a military government with arms or with catapults when they are holding tangers. That will be catastrophic. So by nature it has to be non-violent. Non-violent resistance will take time. But we need to also celebrate the few wins that we've had the women um, equality gains that we are gaining, the student voice that is growing strong, the church voice that was muted, but that is becoming very, very strong. So we have no choice. We need to organize. We need to mobilize. We are united in our misery. I'm thinking that at some point, the policemen who are arresting us when we say we need a living wage, they will not have even the power to arrest us. They are also in misery. Mm. What we need is not to hope that the misery will simply work on itself. We need also to conscientize the police, those in the prison service. So let us be arrested. And when we go there, we conscientize them. We conscientize the police, we conscientize the ZPC. Yes, thank you. Okay, we're going to have Bishop also come in and respond. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think one thing that we need to admit is that yes, as human beings, we have had our own um, failures. We are frail, we are vulnerable. Um, we, we are not made of iron and steel, but blood and flesh. And so at times, we, there's a tendency on our part at times to get weary. But of course, we need to be encouraged that those that wait upon the Lord, those that are motivated on the basis of principles, will have to be push on. So, admittedly, yes, we have uh, uh, carried uh, out uh, activities at times uh, ad hocly. But one question we also need to ask ourselves uh, now onwards, you know, I take this as a time for reflection. We need to say to ourselves, what is it that we have never done, that if we were to do, things will change? And I want to assure you that the state knows that. The system knows that. It is persistence. It is resilience. It is readiness to die. Now, how do you crush somebody who is ready to die? Mm -hmm. I've, I've always insisted that uh, you know, to those that threaten me, don't threaten me because I don't respond to threats. Don't tell me that uh, you will kill me just to kill me. So we need to be able to come to a point where we said we are ready to die. When one of us is arrested, when Shimon is arrested, when God's word is arrested, let them arrest us all. And this is one thing that these guys are afraid of. And from all the sectors, church, 
uh, labor, etc. Let us speak one voice. Let us define our destiny and lead the proceedings towards that destiny. Thank you, uh, Comrade Mahia. Uh, two questions. First, from uh, Likazino. Uh, that uh, what is it that is going to be done differently? Is that correct? What is going to be done differently is citizen mobilization and citizens taking the lead. The greatest mistake any leader can ever make is to assume that the leader is the struggle. And is to assume that the leader is the one who is the alpha and omega of what the people must do. Let us take back the struggle to where it belongs, in the hands of the people. The country we want to see is in our hearts and in our heads. And we can only unleash it for future generations and for ourselves when we begin to all act, not as politicians, not as trade unions, not as churches, but as citizens. So the bottom line is for us to go back to our common denominator, that which unites us, being citizens of Zimbabwe. And we need to be united as citizens. That's why I said this is not about ZANU, this is not about MDC, this is not about the old, the young, it's about everybody. Because our common destiny is under threat. Our common future has been jeopardized, and we need to rescue it, to rescue it. We are a lost nation, we are a broken nation. We need to discover ourselves. And to discover ourselves, we need unity. So that is the different thing that we are going to see. This is no longer about MDC being the big party or ZCT being the bigger brother. This is about all of us being united and having a common platform. And citizens united can never be defeated. No army, no weaponry, no armory can stand when the people say enough is enough. And that is what we are saying now, to draw the line in the sand. No matter the cost, we are determined to move forward. So I hope I've answered you without saying much. This is a convergence of citizens, and we are ready to have that mobilization taking place and that mobilization advanced. The second one, uh, you said unity. You know, I have to disabuse uh, you know, the nation and ourselves of this whole notion that MDC is divided. There's no division. The people are united. We are united. The fact that we have a few individuals who, out of their own cases of convenience, choose to go the other side, does not make us divided. You are talking about names you are mentioning. They have chosen to side with the, those who are oppressing us. It has nothing to do with the unity of our people. Zimbabweans are united, they know what they want. And I told you, don't make the mistake of confusing or conflating MDCT and MDC Alliance. It's like ZANU Ndonga and ZANU PF. They are two separate institutions. We are two separate institutions. Let MDCT go and contribute to the liberation of Zimbabwe. We are contributing. That is the end of the story. So don't waste time on things that are not really issues. Because the people are united. We in the leadership, in the alliance, are united. And we are uniting with other progressive forces. That is what, it ma what matters. And don't really focus to say, ah, no, this, this, ah. Uh, we are united, and you will see the unit of the people when we start acting. Thank you, Mr. President. So I'll take